it's Molly. So I've been wanting to make this video for a while because I haven't really talked too much about my chronic illness here on YouTube. And one question that I get a lot is how did I know I was sick? And then how did I receive my actual diagnosis? So I was diagnosed with Sjogren's Syndrome in November of 2015, so it's been almost three years. And Sjogren's Syndrome is an autoimmune disease, um, which is a type of disease where your body attacks its own healthy cells. So normally, your body will build up antibodies against invading cells, like if you get a cold or the flu or whatever the case may be. In the case of an autoimmune disease, your body is creating antibodies against healthy cells because it mistakes them as invading cells. So the way that Sjogren's manifests itself for me is in a lot of fatigue. That was the first sign of it. And then it's also known for causing dry eyes and dry mouth because Sjogren's specifically attacks moisture producing glands like the salivary glands. Um, I didn't have those symptoms at first. I did have one kind of episode, which I'll talk about later, but those symptoms did develop about two years into my diagnosis. And then the third thing, other than the fatigue and the dryness, is that I get sick a lot. So I do work with babies at a daycare. I'm a infant toddler teacher. Um, but I get sick way more than anyone else at my work does because since my body is so busy attacking its healthy cells, um, it misses a lot of the actual invading cells that are coming in and it doesn't have as much energy to fight those ones off. So I tend to get sick more often and stay sick longer than a healthy person would. So back to the reason for this video, the way that I knew I was sick was um, that that summer I was home from college and I was working full time at the daycare that I still work at part time now. And so I was working eight hour days, I believe I was working eight to four most days. And I would come home and I would just crash on the couch and be absolutely exhausted and fall asleep. And oftentimes my mom would come home after her nine to five and find me asleep on the couch. Now that may sound fairly normal for a 20 something college kid, um, but I, have always loved getting my sleep. I need to get eight hours, so I wasn't supposed to be that tired after a work day. I've never been a napper, and I've always gotten as much sleep as I needed at night, so it was weird that I was suddenly napping so much. The second thing is that that summer, I had three stomach bugs. It was horrible. I actually um, vomited 20 times during the year that I was 20, which is a weird fact I know that I counted, but um, it's true, and only one of those was from alcohol. Let me just add that in there. 19 of them were from stomach bugs, and I had colds in between them, and I had a fever at one point, and I had just so much sickness that summer, so I missed a lot of work too. Not only was I falling asleep after it, but I missed a lot of days of work, and this was just like totally unusual for me. This was not normal. And the third thing is that at the end of August, right before I was about to go back to school for my junior year, I woke up one morning and I had a totally swollen right cheek. And it was visibly swollen, it was like a chipmunk cheek. And then when I tried to eat my breakfast, like I couldn't even chew, it was so uncomfortable. So I thought I had thrown my jaw out because I've had trouble with TMJ in the past, now I wear a night guard, so I haven't had an issue with it. But the fact that I couldn't chew made me think it was my jaw. So I went to an urgent care facility and they looked at it and they were like, this is super weird. And they did a CAT scan of it and it came back that it was peritidis, which is a swollen parotid gland. And that's one of your salivary glands in your cheek. And this was really, really strange. And I asked the nurse like, what would cause this? And she was like, I've actually never seen this in my whole career. And when I Googled what would cause peritidis, the three things that were the main causes were mumps, which I did not have bad oral hygiene, which I also did not have. I brush my teeth twice a day. I use mouthwash and floss and all that jazz. And third was Sjogren's syndrome, which was something super weird that I had never heard of. And so I just ignored that part of it. So they put me on antibiotics for the peritidis. It went away. Everything was fine, although I still wasn't feeling like myself. And I went back to school. And um, let's just say from the Day I moved back into school, it was rough. I was not feeling like myself. I was exhausted. It was making me really, really anxious that I wasn't feeling like myself. So I had a lot of anxiety, a lot more panic attacks um, that I had not experienced something like that since middle school when I first was diagnosed with anxiety. So just everything was kind of coming up and I felt like I was drowning underwater and I did not know what to do. So my mom and I finally convinced my primary care doctor to run an immunodeficiency panel. I thought that I was maybe immunodeficient because I kept getting sick. And everyone kept telling me, the doctors, 
that it was because I lived in a dorm and it was because I worked with little kids and blah, blah, blah. And I said, but no one else that lives in a dorm and no one else at my work is getting this sick this much. There's something wrong with me. So we finally convinced my primary care to run some kind of panel and the results came back weird. Shocker. And let me just say that I love my primary care doctor. Um, I've been with her since I was 18. She's very good. She's the one that discovered my thyroid nodule, but that's a whole separate video in itself. And she said something to me that has stuck with me to this day um, because I think it shows one of the biggest problems in the medical community and in healthcare. And she said, if I hadn't run that panel, which my mom and I had to advocate really hard for her to do, I would have just told you to go to your psychiatrist and have your anxiety meds increased. And that really stuck with me because there, it, there is something physically wrong with me that was causing symptoms that were causing my increased anxiety. Um, but my great, educated, wise doctor's first reaction was that I just needed more mental health, that it was all in my head. And that's the biggest worry for so many people who do end up having chronic illnesses is that all of this is all in their head and that they're crazy. And I wasn't, there was something wrong. And so my primary care sent me to an immunologist. And those are the doctors that usually help with like allergies and stuff like that. So he ran some tests and what he found was an elevated IgG or immunoglobulin G. And that's also known as polyclonal hypergamma globulinemia. Um, and that word in itself freaked me the heck out. And I remember researching it and like not finding any information that made any sense, quite like with the parotitis. And he thought that maybe I had some sort of immunoglobulin related disease or a connective tissue disorder. So he ran a bunch more tests. And a few of the levels that he found in my blood labs sent me straight to a rheumatologist. So my immunologist's tests found that I had positive ANA, which are anti-nuclear antibodies. And those are antibodies that your body builds up against normal cells or healthy cells. Having a positive ANA doesn't necessarily mean that you have an autoimmune disease, um, but it's one factor in a complex constellation of factors um, that can point to having autoimmune disease. And the other thing that he found that was really important was that I had positive Rho and La. And those are both autoantibodies that are associated with Sjogren's syndrome and lupus. So the Rho is one of the most important factors in diagnosing Sjogren's syndrome because it's one of the more unique ones to that disease. So when my immunologist saw that I had positive Rho and La, positive um, ANA, he was like, this looks like something for a rheumatologist, and they sent me over there. So once I got to the rheumatologist, um, they already kind of suspected Sjogren's because of the blood work that would have, had already been done, but they decided to do more, and they found a few more factors in that constellation I was talking about that finally led to my diagnosis. So they found in my blood that I had a high sed rate. Um, anything over 20 is considered high. Mine has been anywhere between 22 and 68. At my last appointment, which was about a month ago, it was 33. Um, so my sed rate will always be high no matter what, no matter what medication I'm on, that's one of the hallmarks of my autoimmune disease. And then they also found the presence of a rheumatoid factor, which shows the presence of a rheumatic disease, and the main ones of those are Sjogren's, lupus, and rheumatoid arthritis. So those three diseases um, are very much connected and they're kind of all in the same family. And then finally I had the positive Sjogren's antibody. Um, there is no hard and fast test for Sjogren's. Like I said, it's a constellation of symptoms and blood labs, but um, about 70% of people with Sjogren's do have a positive Sjogren's antibody. So that was just another factor that went into it. So just to quickly go through that again, all that medical talk, the way that I was diagnosed was through my symptoms of fatigue, of common sickness, and parotitis, which is the swollen product gland. And then my blood labs, which showed positive ANA, positive Rho and La, positive Sjogren's antibody, positive rheumatoid factor, high sed rate. Am I forgetting anything? No, I think that's it. So um, that was how they diagnosed my Sjogren's syndrome. It was through the um, symptoms and then what they found in the blood labs. And it was a very confusing diagnosis to receive because A, I had never heard of it. Um, you know, I had heard of things like lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, and I knew maybe like a tiny, tiny bit about them, but I had never heard of Sjogren's syndrome. And when you Google Sjogren's syndrome, it's going to say that it's mostly in women over 40 and it causes dry eyes and mouth. Now I was 20, I had just turned 20, 
and I didn't have dry eyes or mouth. So I was like, how can I possibly have Chauvin syndrome when it's for women who have dryness in their 40s? Like I, I didn't understand. And I just had to learn that autoimmune diseases and all chronic illnesses in general, they present differently in everyone. And the symptoms that one person may have, another person may not. So I did develop the dryness over time, but I didn't have it at the beginning. And some people with Sjogren syndrome experienced nerve pain or joint pain or all kinds of other issues that I have not experienced. So it's important to remember that um, your illness isn't going to look like someone else's, but that doesn't mean that your diagnosis is wrong. So I wanted to share all of this with you because I do get questions quite often about um, how I knew that I was sick from people that might be feeling like they maybe have a little something going on with their health. And what I will say is always advocate for yourself. I was so lucky to have my mom advocating for me and with me at my doctors because like I said, if she hadn't run that lab that we requested so strongly so many times, um, none of this would have been figured out. And that's one of the reasons that it usually takes so many more years to get a diagnosis. Whereas I got mine about three months after I started questioning what was wrong with me and that was really lucky. So definitely advocate for yourself and don't fall into the trap of thinking that you're crazy or thinking that it's all in your head. And if your doctor won't listen to you, find another doctor and have them run tests until they find out what is wrong with you. Because if you're feeling off in your body and you know your body best. And so if you're feeling off and you really think there's something wrong with you, you have to just keep running with that until you get the answers that you're looking for. So please don't take anything I said today as medical advice. I'm totally not a doctor. And if you think you have Sjogren's syndrome, um, but you don't have all these same things as me, that's totally normal. Um, like I said, they present differently in all people. Um, but this is just my personal story of how I was diagnosed with Sjogren's syndrome, how I knew that something was really wrong with me because I was just feeling so off, so tired, getting sick all the time, stuff that never happened to me before and I hadn't changed my lifestyle at all that would affect it in those ways. I hope that this helps some of you guys who have been wondering how I was diagnosed and I hope that it also empowers you to talk to your doctor if you think something is going on in your body. And if you have any more questions about um, my Sjogren's or whatever, check out my blog. It's balancedandblissful.com. Um, I have a whole section on chronic illness. I write a lot about it. And you can always feel free to email me at molly at balancedandblissful.com or write a question in the comments here um, or on my blog or wherever. And I will get back to you and do my best to help. I can't give out any medical advice, but I can always give out my personal experience and advice. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this and I hope you'll hit like and subscribe and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. There's an ice cream truck going by. I don't know if you can hear it. <laughs> Should I run out there and get some? That'd be a video. <laughs>